After Silicon Valley Bank or SVB shut down, the value of USD coin or USDC, the world's fifth largest cryptocurrency, hit an all-time low on Saturday at 88 cents to $1. The US firm Circle, which is responsible for the coin, disclosed that $3.3 billion of the $40 billion in USDC reserves, which support it, were held at the defunct financial institution. And these events have disrupted the balance of DeFi protocols and their interconnected systems. And as a result of the USDC stablecoins deep hegging, the crypto projects and investors have been thrown into chaos, triggering a massive chain reaction. So today in this episode, we are joined by Paul Lay, the protocol management lead at Gauntlet, who will share his insights and analysis on the recent USDC price fall and its ripple effects on DeFi. Let's dive in. So Paul, can you give us an introduction to yourself and also Gauntlet? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, really looking forward to this uh, discussion, Trevor. Um, so for background, I'm Paul Lay. I'm the protocol management lead at Gauntlet. Um, Gauntlet provides financial risk management solutions uh, to decentralized uh, finance protocols. Our clients include uh, protocols like Compound, Aave, Moonwell, Venus, and others. Um, as the protocol management lead, I oversee uh, the delivery of our platform to our clients and help ensure our clients are making informed decisions around uh, risk management. Um, and before uh, Gauntlet, I was an investment banker at Goldman, uh, specifically in the financial institutions group, um, advising banks and other financial institutions. Uh, so personally, it was really fascinating to see how this um, situation started from traditional finance and then um, spilled over to decentralized finance. So yeah, that's a, a bit of background on, on me and Gauntlet. Awesome. So let's start with the questions. So the first one is, Paul, could you just, you know, take us through what happened with the USDC depegging saga and also then maybe touch upon how has this cascaded into DeFi protocols? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for context, USDC lots its equivalents uh, to the dollar uh, trading to as low as 88 cents um, over this past weekend. Um, it was a downstream effect of SVB, Silicon Valley Bank's insolvency. So at a high level, uh, USDC is a collateralized stablecoin, so it maintains its value by having reserves backing uh, the stablecoins issued. And uh, Circle, which is the company that issues USDC, um, had around $3.3 billion of reserves sitting in SVB. So when SVB became insolvent, um, the market um, um, understood that, hey, if depositors cannot be made whole, there are not full reserves backing uh, USDC stablecoins anymore. Um, in terms of how it impacted DeFi, USDC is heavily integrated into decentralized finance ecosystems. Um, it is largely considered a safe haven for its equivalence uh, to the US dollar. Um, for example, people trade USDC on decentralized exchanges. Uh, people can deposit USDC on lending protocols and borrow USDC on lending protocols on an infrastructure level even. Liquidators view USDC as a numeraire for liquidations. So when USDC lost its equivalence uh, to the dollar, um, there was risk exposure as a result of all the leverage that was built on top of USDC in the DeFi ecosystem uh, more broadly. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely an interesting thing that, you know, is, that we've seen recently. Um, so which type of protocols were impacted by the USDC deep, deep pegging? And also what were the main drivers behind their risks? For sure. Um, so protocols with leverage uh, were uh, mostly impacted. Um, so at, at a high level, there are protocols that allow uh, users uh, to uh, deposit assets as collateral and borrow other assets um, or mint other assets. These protocols include uh, protocols like money markets protocols, as well as collateralized stablecoin protocols. Um, and the way these kind of protocols work at a high level is, you know, when the price of the collateral of users fall below the price, uh, the value of borrow that users have, um, this can introduce a shortfall, which if liquidations fail, this ends up in bad debt for these protocols, which results in the loss of user funds. Um, so you can easily kind of imagine a scenario where users have deposited USDC um, as collateral and borrowed other assets. And if the price of USDC falls to a certain extent and liquidations fail, 
um, or adverse liquidations happen, this can result in a loss of user funds. Um, the interesting thing is that um, kind of on a protocol mechanism design level, um, the situation of USDC depegging um, wasn't really considered a realistic scenario by many protocols. As a result, uh, when protocols designed their mechanisms or parameterized uh, new mechanisms, that didn't incorporate um, the kind of likelihood of a USDC um, drawdown from, from, from par. Um, in terms of kind of what were the main drivers of risks, um, it came down to, to several um, factors that um, impacted protocols risk exposure um, to this USDC situation. The first is what are the mechanisms um, of the protocol? Uh, for example, what price feed are they using? Uh, some protocols use a dynamic price feed for uh, USDC. Other protocols actually hard code the price of USDC at $1. And back when they made a decision, it wasn't a totally irrational decision. It was to protect against other types of risk, such as price manipulation. But the mechanisms impacted uh, the risk exposure. Um, the second um, is user positions. Um, on different protocols, um, you know, users have obviously different positions, and users uh, and protocols also list different assets. So, for example, some protocols like Compound has a shorter list of of assets um, that may uh, lead to the protocol being less risky than other protocols. And the third is the risk controls of uh, the protocol. What mechanisms are in place to protect the protocol in the case of extreme market scenarios? For example, other some protocols like Aave v3 um, have supply caps. Um, other protocols um, have you know different isolated pools that can help restrict exposure for USDC. So all these different factors um, either magnified or mitigated uh, the risk of USDC exposure. So the next question is, how did they manage the risk given the large amount of TVL that was involved? Yeah, um, the interesting thing is that in extreme market situations like these, the traditional assumptions about risk uh, may, no, may no longer hold true. So for example, assumptions around price discovery, liquidity, and very importantly, liquidator behavior uh, may no longer hold true in these scenarios. So it was very important uh, to be able to adapt predictive models to simulate how different risk scenarios uh, would impact protocols and what scenarios would protocols face the most exposure and how to quantify that exposure. And through that understanding of risk, protocols can then make informed decisions on um, strategies uh, to mitigate their exposure. Um, the actions that protocols uh, took uh, largely were divided into two main categories. Um, the first is managing risk exposure for new hypothetical uh, positions, so new positions entering in the protocol. And the second was managing risk exposure for existing positions and the skew of you know which risk is weighed more heavily for protocols it really depended on a variety of factors that we touched upon earlier um, but what we saw was protocols really took different actions uh, depending on the risk exposure and the mechanisms they, they had in place so some uh, protocols for example only paused um, the addition of new positions other protocols um, we're only considering pausing borrows, uh, not supplies. And even other protocols were considering uh, pausing the liquidation mechanism itself. Uh, so all sort of depended on what those different factors were and what was going to be the most impactful with the greatest marginal benefit to, to each protocol. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting. So the next question is, how will the industry react differently next time should similar depegging events happen again? For sure. Um, this was a very uh, unique uh, situation. Um, I think there are, we, we observed that there are a few things uh, that protocols can consider moving forward. Uh, the first is having faster risk controls. Um, because these protocols are decentralized with decentralized governance, oftentimes it takes seven days or even longer to make any changes uh, to the protocol. And there are certain emergency measures, um, but if there is a faster path with more controls, um, 
of course, there are trade-offs, but one of the benefits is protocols being able to more dynamically um, change protocol settings in order to protect user funds. So the first is the speed of risk controls. And the second is continuous research on risk management. As we have observed, um, you know, risk scenarios constantly evolve over time. New types of risks are introduced. And as protocols continue to innovate and build on top of each other, it will be increasingly important to research how risk evolves and in line with that, how do risk management practices change? For our final question is, has the full event unfolded with the USDC depegging situation? And are there any further dominoes to fall in crypto that could be triggered by the banking crisis? We're not fully out of the woods yet. Um, in terms of price stability, prices uh, for USDC have um, largely stabilized um, over the last few days. Um, but if you observe uh, the liquidity conditions, it hasn't fully recovered. So if you observe, uh, for example, pairwise liquidity for USDC, USDT, the 2% depth on the upside is around three times higher than the 2% depth on the downside. So liquidity conditions haven't fully um, returned to normalcy despite the fact that prices have largely stabilized. Um, so it's important to uh, continuously monitor how these conditions um, have evolved for not just USDC, but for other assets as well before kind of declaring that um, everything is um, kind of back back to normal before USDC crisis situations. So Paul, for you know the viewers out there that want to find out the latest information from everything that's happening with Gauntlet, um, you know where, where can they go? For sure, we are very responsive on Twitter. Uh, so find us uh, at Gauntlet Network. That's G-A-U-N-T-L-E-T -E Network. Um, and, you know, happy to discuss anything there. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Paul. This was definitely an awesome interview. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks, Trevor.